morning's docket. That is case number 105245, Golden Rule Insurance Company v. Robert Tomlinson. May it please the court, Amy Morgan, on behalf of the Appalese Kansas Department of Insurance and the former Assistant Commissioner, Tom Munson. Mr. Chief Justice, I'd like to reserve three minutes, please. Three minutes is granted. This court granted the department's petition for review following a Court of Appeals decision reversing the final order of former Assistant Commissioner, Tom Munson. That final order found appellant golden rule in violation of the Kansas Unfair Trade Practices Act. The order had previously been affirmed on review by the District Court of Shawnee County, Kansas. Appalese now seek this court's ruling affirming the final order. Pursuant to the Kansas Judicial Review Act, this court exercises the same statutorily limited review of the department action as did the District Court, as if Golden Rule's initial appeal had been made directly to this court. As briefed by the parties, the scope of this court's review is in accordance with KSA 77629, as amended in 2009. Unless the court has specific questions about that scope of review or wants me to expand on it, I'll move right on to the issues for review. All right, I, I hope and I would like to address each of the three issues on, the re on review, but I will jump right into the first one that was brought before the court, which relates to the statutory framework that confirms that under the facts of this case, the insurance company was bound by the conduct of its appointed agent. Specifically, KSA 4239 provides a definition of an insurance agent in this case, and it sets forth a scope of that agent's authorization. This statute, which was enacted in 1927, but which was retained when the Licensing Act was enacted in 2001, has supplemental definitions to those provided in the Licensing Act. And I will quote from 4239. I will leave out superfluous language, but this is an important statute. An insurance agent is hereby defined to be an individual authorized in writing by an insurance company to negotiate or affect contracts of insurance on behalf of such insurance company. Under the terms of this statute, an insurance agent in Kansas then, by definition, holds the power to negotiate contracts on behalf of an insurance company. This is important because it plainly confirms the position taken in the final order it, as to on whose behalf the agent works. There are other statutes that come into play, that, and I will rely on our briefing. I did want to point out one issue that has arisen for, from Golden Rule's position, and that is that the agent here, McClary, was not an independent, or was not an agent of the insurance company, but rather he was an independent broker. Now, Kansas has not licensed a broker since 2001. In fact, there, if you were a broker as of July 1, 2001, when the Licensing Act was enacted, you were no longer a broker. Um, there is a definition of broker that was retained in the Licensing Act, but most people consider the term to be antiquated. In the Licensing Act, under the definitional section 40-4902, it indicates that broker could be used interchangeably for agent, insurance agent, and the like, unless the context provides otherwise. Again, this is a very important part of the statute because broker is specifically defined in subsection D of 40-4902. And what it says is vital here. Again, quoting but leaving out superfluous language. Broker means any individual who acts or aids in any manner in negotiating contracts of insurance or in placing risks or in soliciting or affecting contracts of insurance as an agent for insured and not as an agent of an insurance company or any other type of insurance carrier. What does this mean? It means that if you act as a broker, you act for an insured, but you cannot be acting as an agent for an insurance company. Which is exactly what the contract 
said between Golden Rule and McClary, it says you will be acting on behalf of the insurer. That's right, Your Honor. And I want to point out here that he was an appointed agent of the insurance company in Kansas, licensed he agents. Was, he was a uh, certified agent according to the insurance department records, but as between McClary and the principal, Golden Rule, uh, it specifically said he was not appointed an agent. Right, and that begs the question, what is the authority of an IBC, the independent broker's contract here, over this statute, or any statute in the code? Because this specific statute that defines broker... Yeah, I understand all that, that, okay. that the, the insurance uh, uh, statutes say you have, if you're going to do business in Kansas, you have to uh, designate and certify or appoint or whatever an agent and have, and their name has to be uh, on the records. You bet. Uh, uh, but how do you translate that into the uh, appointed person has, or the uh, appointing authority, the insurance company has to be liable as a principal? Well, That's the next step that you have to take. Absolutely. And, and let me address it by first looking at the terms of the independent broker's contract, which Golden Rule does rely on. First, Private contracts such as an independent broker's contract are subject to the insurance code, and agents and their principals cannot choose to opt out at their own discretion. And in fact, the language of the IBC itself defers to state law. Section 1.1 of that contract says that its agent's authorization is subject not just to the terms of the contract, but is also subject to, quote, any applicable state or federal laws. In addition, the Insurance Agents Licensing Act confirms that the IBC is subject to the insurance code under 40-4911. And that is because, Your Honor, I see you. <laughs> McClary, there's nothing to preclude, uh, as a matter of common law anyway, that McClary acting as a broker uh, for this insured, is there? I'm sorry, I don't understand well, your question. We haven't uh, abolished the concept that a person can represent an insured in obtaining coverage. It, You're just saying that if you do so, you can't operate directly with the company, you have to go through a, an appointed agent? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think answering the first part of that question, if you serve as a broker in Kansas, you get paid by the insured only if you have a written contract with that insured. That didn't occur here. He had no contract with the insured. So the touchstone is if you get a commission from the insurance company, you you cannot legally be a, a representative of the insured? Under the IBC, he was precluded from obtaining any payment from an insured. Well, and does that, does that decide the question? No. Is who pays the commission? No. Does that decide the question on an agency? Uh, uh, no, I, I think it goes far beyond that, Your okay. Honor. Um, public policy really precludes the notion that an independent broker's contract could somehow trump the statutes that are in place. Because in Kansas, insurance companies act through their agents, and they act in Kansas under the authorization and regulations of our insurance code. But I, I think it's important to look at the framework of this narrow case. We have statutes in Kansas that define what an insurance agent is and with a narrow scope of that authority. There is not particular tension between the terms of this IBC and our codes because 40-239 allows an independent agent, or excuse me, an insurance agent to negotiate contracts of insurance. And that is precisely what this IBC allowed him to do. And in fact, it's precisely the act he undertook in this case. That act of uh, obtaining and submitting uh, applications, which he's authorized by statute and under the IBC, is exactly what he did here. And it was during that exact act where his error or misconduct occurred. So I don't think it's a stretch for this court to say under the very narrow facts of this case, the statute is somewhat in harmony with what the IBC allowed him to do and what he in fact did do. It may be in harmony on what he was allowed to do, but not on his classification. That's really where this breaks down. It, it does. And, and I'm, I guess my first question for you is whether the, the uh, statutory 
provisions that you've cited replace common law agency? They don't. Okay. Um, so really, that IBC just deals with whether there is express uh, an express relationship where he's permitted to be an agent for the insurance company. Yes, and, and it really begs the question about um, a functional analysis of what is a broker and what is an insurance agent and what is a captive agent. Because in Kansas, our statutes apply to all insurance companies equally, regardless of your business model. So golden rule here, they have a business model, at least in some part, of using um, independent agents. That means that that agent can be can work on different behalf of different companies. But but some insurance companies in Kansas, like a State Farm or an American Family, use captive or exclusive agents. And the statutes do not differentiate. There's no double standard. Everyone is held to the same standard. But I, I do think it, it, it lets me turn to common law and, and, and address where, that. And that's yes. where I want to go. Is yes. I, I don't think the statutes are your... Are, uh, uh, dispositive here. They're just dispositive of perhaps one question, and that's yes. on express agency. There are several key cases in Kansas that support the presiding officer's conclusion that under the facts of this case, the appointed agent of Golden Rule was acting as Golden Rule's agent. Boy, I'm running short on time. It goes quicker I than will, I think. I so, will tell you that the cases that I think are most favorable for the department. Right. Chisholm, which is this court's 2010 decision, um, it was very clear that it says if the insurance co company's agent completed the application and either knowingly entered false information or failed to ask the applicant for information, under those circumstances, the insurance company is stopped from rescinding the policy. Shin is a 1917 case that's, that's similar, and Cooley, 1951. Schneider, 1968. But in addition, Kansas common law has defined what a soliciting agent is, and we think that that definition fits him here. Continental defined what a soliciting agent is. Pettijohn, Earth Scientists, each of these cases were briefed in our case. And you're okay. distinguishing, excuse me, uh, you're distinguishing the soliciting agent from a broker. Right. Uh, uh, and explain that briefly. Right. The definition of a soliciting agent under common law, and also um, solicit is defined in the statute, so it works hand in hand, is that they can sell the policies. They seek people to purchase the policies. They make the application. They collect the premium. And that's exactly what he did here. He fits the definition of a soliciting agent. And, and the, the, the normal independent <clears throat> agent that's given authority to bind coverage doesn't exist here. And so we really have a hybrid between the, the, the ordinary independent agent that really is an agent uh, for multiple uh, companies and someone that can do part of what an agent can do but is excluded from doing other parts. Right. I, I think that what happened here, if I may just answer the question. Your Honor. Certainly. Um, he was authorized to act as an independent agent, meaning that he could sell contracts on behalf of more than one agency. Um, he contacted her. He solicited her to purchase a policy, and she did so. That was authorized not only by statute, but under the terms of his contract, and that is where the error occurred, and that is why agency should be imputed to the insurance company. Counsel, it, me. go ahead. In other words, the contract cuts both ways. I, it, I think it does. It purports to limit his behavior in certain respects, but in, that, in doing so, controls his behavior. Yes. Okay, I have another question that has to do with Remedy. So if you have something else on agency? No, I was going to ask her to put a human face on this rather dry academic discussion, but you go ahead and then we'll go back to the facts. Okay. 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 Um, I want to talk about uh, whether the remedy was justified under the statutes. Um, where in the original uh, decision, not, not the emergency order, but the final decision mm -hmm. from the agency, is there a factual finding on uh, flagrancy or conscious disregard? I couldn't find it. I didn't find it either. Um, but under the Judicial Review Act, under subsection C7, this court reviews an agency finding with facts that are made or implied. And it can only be implied. The fact that those words were omitted from the final order, it can only be implied that he had to have found those to have occurred under 402404.9. 
in order to have found that they were liable for violating subsections D and F. So that's kind of that reverse engineering point uh, that the Court of Appeals made. It is, and um, under the under the Review Act, under subsection E, I believe, you know, harmless error needs to be noticed by this court too. So his failure to include those two terms doesn't render his final order substantively without merit. Counsel, as I indicated, uh, before you sit down, since we have people watching these proceedings on the internet and we have a courtroom full of people who may not know what this case is about other than it's a dispute about insurance, could you tell us why this is important to the uh, person who was obtaining the insurance in this case? What was at stake? Yes, Your Honor. The underlying proceedings arose from a complaint that a consumer made to our department, and she alleged that the appellant insurance company had denied her benefits under her policy. And specifically, Golden Rule had denied her approval to undergo abdominal surgery, and then they ultimately notified her that they would exclude any coverage for abdominal disease or disorder and they canceled her policy. So it came to us um, on the basis of Golden Rule's defense. They said, well, she had submitted but, a false but that application. Was, the denial was because she had pre-existing conditions yes. that were not disclosed on the application for her uh, insurance to Golden Rule. Exactly, exactly. Important. And Your Honor, um, that, that's an important point that the department does not dispute. She had an extensive health history. She disclosed that history to the agent. The record in both the evidentiary hearing, the depositions, um, the hearing transcripts is fairly one-sided that she disclosed it and she had two witnesses to say that. The error was on the part of the agent in failing to make that disclosure to his um, insurance company. Does that give enough flavor? That does. Thank you. Okay. Any we other questions? And the bottom line here is who bears the burden of uh, McClary, the agent's failure to correctly fill out the application, the insured or the insurance company? That's the bottom line, isn't it? Absolutely. And under the facts of this case, we urge this court to approve and to affirm the final order, which found that the burden fell on the insurance company. All right. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Kevin Fowler and I'm appearing on behalf of Golden Rule Insurance Company. And on behalf of Golden Rule, we would urge the court to affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals based upon a very well-reasoned, comprehensive opinion penned by Judge McEnany, who has not only carefully analyzed all of the factual and legal issues in this case, and this case has a combination of factual issues that really present questions of law because it relates to the hard look doctrine and whether there is substantial evidence to support in the record some of the findings that were made by the assistant commissioner in this case. I, I seem to get the impression that uh, the Court of Appeals uh, was looking at this as if you had either a broker or a captive agent. And they used the uh, 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 term captive agent in, in one particular point, you would agree that there can be uh, uh, an agency agreement uh, between an insurance company and an independent insurance agent, uh, would you not? Absolutely. In fact, there was a plethora of independent agents in the state. In fact, they have their own organization, the uh, independent insurance uh, uh, Association. Uh, so, uh, the tell me why here uh, uh, the Court of Appeals opinion didn't gloss over what is the real issue is whether this independent agent uh, was didn't quite get to the agency agreement got but was a broker. 
Well, I, I don't think that the Court of Appeals glossed over that. Uh, I think that the court, in an effort to try and make sense out of very old decisions, and there are a lot of decisions by this court that go back to the late 1800s and early 1900s when insurance was relatively unregulated, where insurance companies, particularly foreign insurance companies, had what amounted to captive agents, which were either employees or under exclusive contract working for those agents, uh, insurance companies, uh, committing transgressions and then attempting to say the insured doesn't get benefits because there is an agency contract between an insurance company and its captive or exclusive agent, which says notwithstanding the fact that we have a captive or exclusive relationship in which the appointed agent is beholden to the insurance company, that you're nevertheless the agent for the insured. That is not what we have here. And I think what the Court of Appeals was trying to do was to demonstrate that a lot of the old cases that addressed the department's position, where there were claims made that an application was inappropriately filled out by an agent, that in those cases, this was the insurance company's agent acting as the insurance company's agent and not accurately including the information that the insured or prospective insured had provided to the agent. And under those circumstances, the court was not going to allow an insurance company to subsequently say you don't get coverage because your application failed to disclose information that you told our agent but he didn't include on the application. The difference here is that when you have either independent insurance agents or brokers, they are representatives of the insured or the applicant for insurance. And so their acts... All independent, all independent insurance agents are agents of the insured, even if they have binding authority on behalf of the insurance company and even if they have get all of their commissions from the insurance company? Independent insurance agents or independent brokers like Dirk McClary, who do not have any authority except to submit applications on behalf of his own clients that he has solicited for himself as your, part of his your business. Contract, your contract indicates that Golden Rule will provide uh, training and promotional uh, materials and advertising uh, materials uh, to utilize to solicit business on behalf of the company. There are provisions in the contract to that effect. In this particular case, none of those were utilized. As a matter of fact, but that's a little different. You're saying the contract precludes the agency, and what we're looking at it then is the contract. What what uh, uh, well, well, you here, agreed to do and what authority you have uh, invested in Mr. McClary. Well, the, the promotional materials that you're referencing are information that can be generally used in furtherance of his business as an insurance broker. It doesn't connote that he has any authority on behalf of Golden Rule. In fact, the independent broker contract specifically says he does not. How, how do you get around that uh, Kansas doesn't license brokers? The, uh, and the additional fact that Golden Globe uh, can't do business without a designated agent, and they designated McClary as an agent with the insurance department. Uh, and so how can you say that it's okay in Kansas for a, a, a broker to submit directly to the You're, company when, when that doesn't uh, uh, comport with, with the rules under which Golden Rule was admitted to uh, sell insurance in the state? Uh, Your Honor, I, I beg to disagree with uh, the department in this case. The brokers are required to be licensed as insurance agents. The change that occurred in 2001 when Kansas adopted the Uniform Insurance Agent Licensing Act 
to avoid federal preemption and federal regulation of the licensing of insurance agents, brokers, and producers, we adopted a system where separate broker's licenses were eliminated, but brokers were rolled into the insurance agent licensing process, which is why KSA 40-4902K says insurance agent and agent means any person required to be licensed under the provisions of Chapter 40 of the Kansas Statutes Annotated to sell, solicit, or negotiate insurance. For the purposes of this act, whenever the terms agent or broker appear in Chapter 40 of the Kansas Statutes Annotated and amendments thereto, each term shall mean insurance agent unless the context requires otherwise. They eliminated the separate broker's license, but now brokers, which are specifically authorized to do business in this state, have got to get an insurance agent license, and under the statutes that are on the books, as the department has argued previously in this case, in order to be able to transact business under that insurance agent license, KSA 40-240, one specifically provides that if the commissioner of insurance finds that the individual applicant is trustworthy, competent, and has satisfactorily completed the examination, the commissioner shall forthwith issue to the applicant a license as an insurance agent, but the issuance of such license shall confer no authority to transact business in this state until the agent has been certified by a company pursuant to KSA 40-241I. The fact of the matter is, just as it was in the Eichelberg case, in order to ply one's trade as an insurance agent, as a broker, as a producer, it is necessary not only to secure a license from the commissioner, but also an appointment or certification under the Uniform Insurance Agents Licensing Act in order to ply their trade. I don't think that's responsive to my colleague's question. I think he was talking about the difference between a person who's permitted, a, a, an agent who's permitted to submit directly to an insurance company and one who has to go through another agent. Wasn't that your question? Yeah, I, I think he's trying to get there. Okay. Yeah, so you're saying that certification means uh, you certify a broker and so you can go through directly from an insured broker to the company without having a designated agent of the of the company. Is that what you're saying? That's because certification includes brokers, so you don't really have to have agents as such to do business in Kansas. Well, Contrary to what the insurance department is saying is that all business has to be transacted by agents. And it, you're disputing their reading of the statute. Is that what you're saying? No, they, they have to be licensed agents and they have to be certified. But not common law agents. No, that's correct. Not common law agents. And in fact, that's made clear by the legislature's definition of broker. And if, if the world were as the department contends it is in this case, and I'd like to make two, two points. In 1990, the legislature adopted the Managing General Agent Act as part of the insurance code. And at KSA 40-2132J, there is a list of things that a managing general agent, which is uh, an agent that has responsibility for a, a certain segment of a company's business in this state and is responsible for more than 5% of policyholder surplus, that the managing general agent shall not, subsection three, appoint any agent or broker without assuring that the agent or broker is lawfully licensed to transact the type of insurance for which such agent or broker is appointed. Now, this clearly indicates, because the legislature knows how to draft these statutes, that Brokers can be appointed directly by 
general agents or managing general agents of an insurance company. And the fact of the matter is that appointment does not detract from their status as a broker because under the Uniform Insurance Agents Licensing Act, brokers work for insurance in the negotiation or procurement of insurance, which of course is consistent with the traditional definition of a broker. A person who works as an intermediary between applicants for insurance and insurance companies, but who is beholden to nobody in particular. In this case, Dirk McClary was appointed by 37 different companies, according to the undisputed evidence in this record. His first application on behalf of Patty Denny in this case was to Assurant Health and Time Life, which he does 75% of his business with. And it was only after they said, we're not going to provide her coverage, that he suggested to Patty Denny submitting an application to Golden Rule. And that's exactly what happened. He was not acting as Golden Rule's agent. He was acting as Patty Denny's agent. He was looking out for her best interests. It's just that for whatever reason, when he submitted the application with her authorization on her behalf to Golden Rule, he failed to disclose... You, you can say that about any independent agent. Any independent agent. You walk into to a, a insurance agency and you say, I want to buy uh, car insurance. They take, take your uh, demographics and they run it through all of the companies they have there and they place you with the best company. But they're still agents, wouldn't you agree? They have the uh, authority to bind the insurance company uh, uh, for on that insurance. They get all their money. Even though they're acting in the best interest of the customer that comes in, they're still agents. Wouldn't if you they agree? have binding authority, I would agree with that. Okay. Dirk McClary doesn't have any binding so, authority. That's the touchstone here is the binding authority? Well, it's the authority to actually act as the insurance company, which he did not have. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the legislature wants to make sure that agents... Could I, could I submit an application to Golden Rule? No, I'm not, I'm not a certified, trained, or they haven't approved me. You could submit an application as a consumer directly to Golden Rule on the Internet. Do you suppose Ms. Denny even knew whether she was dealing with a broker or an agent? Well, Do you suppose she had any idea? Did it really matter to her? I'm, I'm really not sure. The complaint that she filed with the department referred to Dirk McClary as a broker, and she said that he misrepresented her. She indicated that she knew that he had expertise in the insurance industry, that he had a number of companies that he could do business with, and she relied upon him to provide her with comparable coverage to the Blue Cross Blue Shield policy that she and her family had enjoyed for a period of time, but which had become more expensive, they relied upon him to get her comparable coverage for lower premiums. And that was his charge. That is what Dirk McC McClary attempted to do uh, for Patty Denny. And consequently, he acted as her agent. She authorized him ultimately to submit the application to Golden Rule. A and when that kind of authorization exists, his acts are not imputable to the insurance company they are her responsibility under established precedent in this court. Now, KSA 40-2134, which is also part of the Managing General Agent Act, specifically states that the acts of the managing general agent are considered to be the acts of the insurer on whose behalf it is acting. So when the legislature wants to establish statutory respondeat superior, they know how to do it. They've done it in other contexts. They have not done it with respect to the general provisions of the Uniform Insurance Agents Licensing Act. And of course, Dirk McClary is not a managing general agent. He's not a general agent. If He's we, an dis if we disagree with you, if we disagree with you and find that McClary was in fact Golden Agent or Golden Rules agent, uh, what's the remedy here? Uh, if well, you believe, what happens? If you believe that he was, go uh, if Dirk McClary was Golden Rule's agent, uh, then the next question is whether the 
statutory elements of a violation of a charge violation of the Uniform Trade Practices Act have been satisfied. And one of the issues we raised, in fact, consistently before the agency, the district court, and the Court of Appeals is that there is no evidence in this record as a matter of law to establish that there was any flagrant or conscious disregard of any obligations that were would have been owed to Patty Denny. This isn't the first lawsuit against Golden Rule on this same issue, is it? There have been uh, multiple cases in other states raising the same issue, and it's my understanding the uh, Golden Rule has not been very successful in those lawsuits, and how does that factor into um, the assessment of the uh, good faith reliance uh, on your position? Well, I'm aware of a couple of cases that, at least at, at first glance, might be uh, identified as similar to this one. But each state, unfortunately, has a different scheme. There are states in this country that make the acts of all brokers the responsibility of insurance companies that they do business with. Kansas doesn't have any statutes to that effect. I think those cases uh, are much more fact specific. Here, we don't have any question that there was an independent broker contract that established Dirk McClary only as an independent broker. I think that was true in those other cases too, counsel. Excuse me? I think that was true in those other cases too, wasn't it? Um, without uh, identifying a specific case, I, I one know of, there are a couple one of, of cases. Hawaii. One out of Hawaii. Okay. Um, I believe it, the broker agreement was at the heart of both of them. That's but okay. that, let me tell um, that's something I have to admit we've not previously briefed, haven't even analyzed, but I'm going to suspect let, let, that there let me are... Take you, let me take you to where I really want, want to go. Uh, if we find an agent and we find there's evidence to support the violation of the uh, Unfair Practices Act, then what is the remedy? Here it was ordered that they provide the coverage and pay for the uh, procedure. Is would that be the appropriate remedy uh, if we get to that point? If you lose on the agency uh, question and if you lose on the violation of the Unfair Practices Act, uh, what, do you have any quibble with the remedy? Uh, yes, Your Honor. In fact, that's another one of the issues we raised in this case, which is that the statute that empowers the insurance commissioner to take remedial action does not authorize the kind of relief that was awarded in this case. Well, you what's the point? What's the point of going through all of this uh, to say that uh, uh, the company took such action that wrongfully denied this person, uh, uh, denied her claim, if the remedy isn't to force the company to honor the claim? Well, Your Honor, and that again is another issue. The emergency order was issued because Patty Denny had requested exploratory surgery for a complicated condition, and in connection with that request, the department found out that she had much more of a medical condition than was, than was identified on the application, and consequently, they did not pre-approve her for this surgery. She, this is an indemnity policy that was issued. There's never been a claim made. The insurance commissioner in this case concluded that there was no requirement to predetermine coverage for Ms. Denny. He said, however, that's a moot issue because the claim was pre-denied as a result of the action the company took after finding out that her health status had been misrepresented on the application. And so the fact of the matter is, notwithstanding the fact that the basis for this entire case was Golden Rule's failure to pre-approve this exploratory surgery, we weren't found to have violated that. As a matter of fact, he said you weren't required to. And even though we hadn't been charged with anything else, the insurance commissioner in this case decided to find a violation based on conduct that was never alleged. 
which was you rescinded the policy and therefore effectively denied your claim. Well, that wasn't a claims decision, it was an underwriting decision. And it was issued after we had tried the case on a different theory, without prior notice to the company. That's one of the issues we raised, which the Court of Appeals didn't address. Excuse me, now you're talking about the emergency order, though, aren't you? It, it, it issued after, I just want to get the timeline right in my head. I thought that the <coughs> cancellation of the policy preceded the issuance of the emergency order? It did. Okay. A and the emergency so you're order talking was... about the emergency order now, not the final order from the no, insurance no. department. The, the policy was canceled in July, July right. of 2007. And the emergency order issued the next month, didn't it? Or maybe September? It was August. It issued okay. in August, but it did not raise the cancellation of the policy as a basis for an unfair trade practices violation. But the emergency violation. order, for all intents and purposes, had gone away at this point, at this stage of the litigation. The emergency order wasn't upheld by the district court. Well, what the district court did um, was stay the emergency order. He refused to vacate it. He stayed the order and remanded to the agency for Evidential. formal administrative proceedings, right. which were conducted. And at the conclusion of those proceedings, uh, the assistant commissioner actually vacated the charge against Golden Rule, which the department has characterized as the heart of this case, which was alteration of an insurance policy, and, and Golden Rule was vindicated by the commissioner, who found that Golden Rule was also victimized in this case by Dirk McCleary's conduct. Golden Rule always acted reasonably, they did, and in good faith, which is why the commissioner struggled with finding a violation. I mean, he did that twice. So what's the ultimate answer to my colleague's question? If we agree with your opponent that there was, uh, that, that Mr. McClary was an agent of the insurance company, and we agree that there was um, a failure to, to investigate or, or settle after liability became reasonably established, would it, the exact language of the statute. If we agree with those things, what kind of remedy do um, we have? The, the statute in the Uniform Trade Practices Act specifies the scope of the commissioner's remedial power. Okay. To order the payment of monies withheld, which there weren't any, to issue a cease and desist order directing Golden Rule uh, not to do this again, to impose a fine for each found violation. There's, there's a very circumscribed number of remedies provided in the statute which were exceeded in this case. And, and on the, the question of remedy, I mean, just so you know, uh, after the final order in this case was issued by the assistant commissioner, uh, Patty Denny filed suit against Dirk McClary and Golden Rule in Leavenworth County, and that litigation got resolved several years ago. And so her quest for a remedy was resolved a couple years ago uh, under the terms of a settlement that have taken, her in, uh, taken care of her interest in this case as a complaining consumer. And so the fact of the matter is, it looks to me as though there isn't even a need for further remedial relief pertaining to Patty Denny, the consumer, who filed the complaint in this case. Do but, you have any, have any further questions of counsel? All right, thank you, counsel. Thank you. Is this akin to a declaratory judgment action then? Absolutely not. Who's, who's aggrieved here? If, well, I mean, if, we, if we've had uh, uh, compensation uh, to the insured, what are we doing here? Are we Your Honor, the department was not a party to any civil litigation. We don't know any of the terms of a confidential deal she reached. Well, what, what remedy are you asking for? We, we need the terms of the final order affirmed. 
if there's if Golden Rule believes it's already satisfied some kind of a final order, it can come back to the assistant commissioner and, and show him why. But this issue of the, in the just so you know category that there was a civil lawsuit has never been briefed, and the department has never been a party to any civil litigation. We our position is strongly that this is an actual case in controversy. There is no notion of mootness here, and if this court were to to think otherwise, we would expect to want to brief that. Um, because this is a very important public policy issue for the department, the, the right of the department to regulate the companies. And if this court were to suggest that in the just so you know category that this case has been resolved so, so the Court of Appeals decision is only reversed on a technicality, that Court of Appeals decision would still be persuasive guidance to Golden Rule and other insurance companies that what they did in this case is okay. And the bottom line here is, that, as I hear it, the disagreement is whether the certification uh, of an agent can include the certification of a broker that is permitted to do business with uh, Golden Rule. Yes. And, and you say that can't, that's not true. Right. And I, I won't repeat the statutory, I know that got kind of dry, but, but you know, Your Honor did have a question as a factual matter about what do we know that the consumer believed? And he said, well, he wasn't sure. I mean, the record is clear. It was her belief, and this is in record 2320, that McClary was an agent of Golden Rule. He was representing that company. Even McClary, when asked, are you an agent or a broker? He said he's an agent. The record shows that he doesn't even think he's a broker. He doesn't fit the statutory definition, and under the facts of this case, he's not. Um, the, the other thing I did want to respond to was about flagrant and conscious disregard. That's a very important finding. And what I wasn't able to reach on my first argument were the fact that the case law in Kansas has been steady since Cooley and beyond. Um, when, when Golden Rule started this process of disputing coverage, they engaged the department in this. And case law was thrown back and forth. We felt very confident that the case law in Kansas said that the acts of the agent are imputed to the agency or to the company. And their disregard of that case law does show flagrancy. They don't want to abide what we, what we feel is a long line of Kansas cases that say under the facts of this case, agency is imputed. I'm sorry, can you just give me the timing on that? You said they engaged. Are you talking about? Yes, Your Honor. Um, she first sought approval for this procedure in January. Right. By May, she had filed a complaint. So rather than running off and filing an emergency order, as we ultimately did after they canceled her policy, um, the department and Golden Rule engaged, and, and this is all on the record, so okay. it's not anecdotal. It is From in there. May to August. Absolutely. And so it wasn't until they canceled the policy altogether that the emergency order was issued. My, my point in this is that there was a debate in their mind about what Kansas law provides, but never in ours. And we don't think that Kansas law has really been disputed about imputed agency to a company. Their disregard of that case law shows that, they're, that it's flagrant and unconscious disregard. I believe I covered everything I needed to. Um, I, I just have one remark in conclusion, unless the court has another question. I, I do. Yes. Uh, so you're saying that if they're a, a certified agent, then they have binding authority on the company, notwithstanding uh, the contract uh, withholds binding authority. I would answer that in a very limited manner. My, my, my short answer to that question is no. The more narrow focused question is that under the facts of this case, absolutely. What he did was authorized by statute and under his IBC and the error, the misconduct that was complained of was precisely within the square corners of what he's authorized to do. We're not arguing that, that he had oral authority to bind a contract or that he could waive provisions or some things that you see in Kansas cases. That's not the situation. You would. You would say that their, their arrangement that the application has to be submitted and approved by the company um, and there is no binding authority doesn't violate your regulations. Say that again. I'm sorry. 
their arrangement, their contractual arrangement, that McClary is only authorized to accept the application submitted to the company for approval and that notwithstanding the insured's idea that I've got coverage today, uh, that wouldn't be a violation of, of the uh, insurance regulations. It's only because the information was false. Right. I, I think um, to answer that question, I would first say that certainly the department is not taking a position that we approve the IBC. It's a private contract not filed with our agency not provided to a consumer. So I don't want to, to suggest to the court that we think that IBC is okay. But for the very narrow purposes for which we are here today, we don't think that there's serious tension with what he did and what he was authorized to do. Do we have any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. We thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.